I'm sure you've heard people say, I'll believe it when I see it. Well, given that mindset, they are placing their faith in sight alone. However, today I want us to consider a related yet opposing thought. Rather than living by the statement, seeing is believing, we should instead place our faith in our Father God who is sovereign over all things. And because of that faith, He will allow us to see miracles become reality. Consider the story found in chapter 9 of Mark's Gospel. There we find a young boy who is demon-possessed and his father who is distraught over his son's suffering. Seeking relief from the demon, the boy's father takes him to Jesus' disciples to have them remove the demon and to allow him to live an ordinary life. However, Jesus' disciples could not exercise the demon. So the boy and his father go to see Jesus, hoping for a miracle. That's where we pick up the story. In the ninth chapter of Mark's Gospel, the last part of the 22nd verse reads, But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. The boy's father was pleading with Jesus, My son has a demon inside him. This demon does terrible things to my son's body. It's very hard for me as a father to watch this happen. Please, Jesus, have compassion on us. And Christ replies in the 23rd verse, If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. You see the picture here? Jesus said, you've got to believe, and because of your faith, you'll see the demon flee from your son. Long story short, Jesus calls out the demon, and the boy is made well. Because of his faith, the boy's father was able to see his son made well. But that's not the end of the story. Remember that Christ's disciples could not exercise the demon from the young man. So the same account is recorded in the 17th chapter of Matthew's Gospel. And in the 19th verse there it says, Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? So Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief. Believing is seeing. Several years ago, around 2 o'clock in the morning, our home phone rang. Typically, any phone call you get at 2 o'clock in the morning doesn't have a message of good news. Likewise, on this early morning, this call was about Lori's mother. Rose had a history of heart issues. At this stage of her life, only a fraction of her heart was functioning. On this morning, Rose had been taken to the hospital. Her heart was racing, and despite all the efforts of the healthcare professionals, they couldn't slow it down. Lori immediately decided that she would quickly go to be by her mother's side. So she got dressed and went to the hospital to be with her mother. Now, I've got a morning routine, and don't break my morning routine because who knows what's going to happen the rest of the day. Each morning, I pretty much stick to a certain order of steps as I prepare for the day. I take a shower, I get dressed, I have my morning prayer time, I eat breakfast, and out the door I go. Well, that particular morning, at 6 o'clock, my internal alarm clock went off and said, Hey, it's time to get up and start your day. So I got out of bed, showered, and I sat down for breakfast. In my morning prayer time, I asked that if it was his will, that Jesus would touch Rose and slow her heart to a normal rate. When I finished my morning prayer, 
I happened to look up at the clock to see how my morning was progressing. The clock read exactly 6.30. So I ate breakfast and headed out the door to make the trip to Lakeland College. About 15 minutes into my commute, I met Lori on the road. Now what I'm about to say next was legal at the time, but it's not now. But it's okay. I didn't break the law. Soon afterward, she called me to tell me about her mother's condition and other details about the morning. She reported that when she arrived at the hospital, Rose's heart rate was extremely fast and everything they had tried failed to slow it down. So they were making preparations to transport her to Springfield. However, at one point in the morning, the nurse had stepped out of the room for a moment. And when she returned, she observed that Rose's heart rate had slowed to a normal rate. The nurse asked Lori and the others in the room, did you see that? Her heart rate just returned to normal for no apparent reason. Lori and the others noticed, but they couldn't explain why the sudden change had happened. When Lori shared those details with me on the phone that morning, I asked her what time it was when Rose's heart returned to a normal rate. She said it was 6.30. Given the time that the miracle happened, I knew exactly who was responsible. It was the will of our Lord. I didn't have to see it to believe it. I had to believe it to see it. Do you believe in miracles? This morning, we're going to consider the composition of a miracle. We're going to look at five components of a miracle. First, you have to have a need. Then there must be a request. The miracle must have witnesses. It must have instant effects, and it must be independent of secondary causes. Now, if you haven't already done so, turn in your Bible to chapter 9 of the Gospel according to Luke, and we'll read there our scripture text today. So Luke, chapter 9, starting with the 10th verse, and we'll read down through the 17th verse. And the apostles, when they had returned, told him all that they had done. Then he took them and went aside privately into a deserted place belonging to the city called Bethsaida. But when the multitudes knew it, they followed him. And he received them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who had need of healing. When the day began to wear away, the twelve came and said to him, Send the multitude away that they may go into the surrounding towns and country and lodge and get provisions, for we are in a deserted place here. But he said to them, You give them something to eat. And they said, We have no more than five loaves and two fish, unless we go and buy food for all these people. For there were about 5,000 men. Then he said to his disciples, Make them sit down in groups of 50. And they did so and made them all sit down. So we're going to stop for just a minute. We're going to look real close at verse 14 and 15 that we just read. In verse 14, Jesus gives his disciples a commandment. Make them sit down in groups of 50. Then we read in verse 15, they made them sit down in groups of 50. That tells me that's an indicator that his disciples believed. Then he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke them and gave them to the disciples to set before the multitude. So they all ate and were filled. And 12 baskets of the leftover fragments were taken up by them. Well, considering the, considering the scripture we read, we want to talk about those five things contained in a miracle. And remember that the first was 
a need. A need is a worthy motive. Here we see a rather large need with a worthy motive. These people came to listen to Jesus. He spoke to them about salvation, and they longed for more of his teaching. Among them were people who had physical needs, so Jesus healed the sick. Preaching and healing was the focus of Jesus' ministry, and this meeting was typical of his time here on earth. But as evening drew near, Jesus' disciples came to him with their concern about the people getting hangry. You know what hangry is? When you're so hungry that your lack of food causes you to become angry or frustrated or maybe both angry and frustrated. Have you been hangry before? One worthy motive is obvious. However, there was more than one worthy motive. Obviously, the people needed something to eat. The second worthy motive was a test of the disciples' faith. Concerning this same event, John records in his gospel that Jesus asked Philip where they were to buy bread for this large group. And all Philip could think of was, how much it would cost. 200 days wages, he said. And yet a third worthy motive was to demonstrate Jesus' deity. Only God can create. Only God could feed a multitude such as was present that day with merely two fish and five loaves of bread. Threefold. Three worthy motives. Satisfy the people's physical hunger. Test the faith of Jesus' closest followers. And prove that Jesus is God's son. The second component of a miracle is a request. In order for Jesus to perform a miracle, there must be a request. If you recall Jesus' first miracle... His mother requested that he turn the water into wine at the wedding feast. In today's scripture text, the disciples asked Jesus to dismiss the crowd so they could get something to eat. You know, often when our children ask a question, we call that moment a teaching moment. Likewise, when the disciples asked about food for the multitude, Jesus recognized a teaching moment, and he used that opportunity to prove that he can provide. When the task appears to be too difficult or impossible, remember that Jesus said, all things are possible if you believe. Often when seeking a miracle, people pray for that miracle, but they don't pray in faith. They make a request with the mindset of, I'll believe it when I see it. But we read in the 11th chapter of Mark, the 24th verse, where it says, Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you will have them. You've got to believe. If you pray for something without believing that God can grant your request, might as well not even make that prayer. Believing takes the emphasis off of prayer itself and puts the emphasis entirely on God himself. It's all about him. The Bible doesn't teach us to rely on prayer alone. It teaches us to rely on God alone. Only when we can fully rely on him can we fully pray believing. We are to believe in him first, then express that belief in prayer. Seeing isn't believing, believing that our Father God is sovereign over all, allows us to see. To God be the glory, the great things he has done. Thirdly, 
a miracle must have witnesses. Feeding the multitude was witnessed by many people. There were 5,000 men plus women and children. Imagine feeding the crowd the size of Effingham with two fish and five loaves. Each of them witnessing the event firsthand. Imagine how many others they told of the miracle in which they personally received a blessing from Christ. Without witnesses, there is no authenticity. There must be someone to verify the miracle. And this event certainly had plenty of witnesses. Four years ago, on a frigidly cold February day, Lakeland College had canceled school due to extremely cold temperatures and blowing and drifting snow. Around 6 o'clock that morning, our phone rang. It was my dad, and he said to come quickly. When he got out of bed and went to check on Mom that morning, she wasn't anywhere to be found inside. My mom suffers from Alzheimer's, and she had wandered outside in the night, fell in a snowdrift in the driveway, and spent a good portion of the night laying on the ground in the freezing temperatures. When I arrived at my parents that morning, which is only two miles away, the ambulance, first responders, and sheriff's deputies were already there. Mom was laying on the floor. She was su surrounded by EMTs. Her skin was gray, and she was pretty much lifeless. They quickly wrapped her in warm blankets and loaded her into the ambulance and headed for St. Anthony's. Dad and I followed the ambulance to the hospital despite the treacherous conditions that the storm had caused that night, praying all along the way for God to make Mom well. Soon after arriving at the hospital, a doctor came and asked Dad and I to meet with him privately. He didn't have a good report. Mom's body temperature was extremely low from her spending the night in a snowdrift. And at this time, her speech was unrecognizable. The doctor's words were, it doesn't look good. However, never underestimate my father God and his capabilities. He is sovereign over all. Believe in him so that you can see his miracles. Long story short, before noon, Mom was speaking normal again and acting like nothing had ever happened. Dad and I went to Niemerg for lunch that day, and on the way back to the hospital, I reminded him, I think you know we witnessed a miracle this morning. Dad and I were firsthand witnesses, answered prayers. It was miraculous because we believed we saw Mom make a miraculous recovery that day. Component number four of a miracle is a miracle must have instant effect. In the third chapter of Acts, the seventh and eighth verses read, and he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. True miracles don't happen in a slow, progressive manner. We don't read of accounts in the Bible where someone prayed for a miraculous healing and that person was healed three months later. The effect of a God-granted miracle isn't delayed. The effect happens in true God fashion. It's miraculous, as only God can do. Number five, the effects of a miracle must be independent of secondary causes. There was a little boy playing with some newborn kittens. He noticed that they had their eyes shut, 
and they couldn't see. He wished they would all open their eyes and see. Nine days later, he was playing with the same litter of kittens. And he noticed that each of them had opened their eyes and they could see perfectly. The little boy's wish came true. Was that a miracle or not? Miracles are clearly events that cannot be explained other than it was the work of our Lord and Savior. Events that don't have a logical explanation. Rose's heart returning to a normal rate astonished the nurse. Did you see what just happened? My mother surviving a horrible night outside in frigid temperatures can only be explained as a miracle. Both of these events were only possible by our Lord and Savior. Jesus feeding the multitude with a few fish and five barley loaves was a miracle that, first of all, had a worthy motive, and not just one worthy motive, but actually three worthy motives. It was requested by his disciples. It had many witnesses. It had instant effects, and it couldn't have been completed by anyone other than Jesus. Most important, because they believed, Jesus allowed them to see. Jesus freely offers to everyone the gift of eternal life. His gift of salvation is given to them who call on him as Lord and Savior. Have you accepted his offer of salvation? If not, What's keeping you from taking that first step to living a life that believing Jesus gave his life as a ransom for yours? If God's spoken to you, now's the time to respond to his calling. As Steve and Jamie come forward and we sing a hymn of invitation, come and have that conversation with him at his altar. If you know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior and desire to become a member of this church, we invite you to join us as we worship and serve our master together. Let us pray.